Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Heavy Checklist Podcast, where we are about to bring you one of the most exclusive interviews with one of the most amazing people in the world, Mr. Ed Milet. This is a man that I look up to. He's like a brother slash dad. Sorry to age you, but he's uh, this, this man is an absolute powerhouse. We're at his beach house here in Laguna Beach, and we're about to show you just how real Ed Milet really is. You've, you've seen and heard the polished Ed Milet that gives the most eloquent speeches and the best podcasts <laughs> and writes the most excellent books, which you should go buy right now. If you don't go buy this, then you're not allowed to listen. You should just, we're probably going to cut you off. Um, <laughs> the Power of One More on Amazon. Uh, audiobooks are available. Life-changing book. But guys, what this is going to be is a conversation between Ed, myself, and some of my very best friends, people who really look up to Ed, people who I believe Ed has changed every single one of our lives uh, for the better. And uh, and it's going to go both ways. This is not just a, hey, Ed, tell me this. Hey, Ed, tell me that. Because yeah. we don't want it to be that way. We want this to be an open dialogue. So Ed is also going to be able to ask us questions. And you guys are going to be able to... I'm t- has anything like this ever happened? No. This, this is a first. This is pretty rare. Yeah, this is cool. This is exclusive yeah. and cool. Yeah. So... Uh, Basically, what we're going to do is kick it off with some questions. And uh, we've got Cole, the law father, who's my partner in multiple businesses. Uh, started off as my attorney. He's uh, he's uh, sexy he's, and jacked, too. Yeah, sexy. He's <laughs> jacked. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I'll yeah. tell you right now, that man in the courtroom, it's like watching a form of art. The is way it, he yeah. litigates yeah. is just absolutely beautiful. I was terrified in my first court case. I thought, long hair, judge isn't going to take him seriously. Bro, he gets up there. And just the words he uses and the way that he's able – world's best negotiator. And I, mm. I bet he could out-negotiate you. That's, Whoa. that's false. Whoa. He's a Let's damn good negotiator. <laughs> so I don't want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I have no interest in finding that out with a lawyer. <laughs> so what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to start off with uh, the law father. Hit him. Oh, okay. So I'm called the law father. Right into your mic. I know. I'm called the law father not maybe because of those negotiation skills that I probably don't deserve, but because my highest and best calling in life is that of a dad. I have six kids under the age of 11, if you can believe that. Busy man. You can probably figure I'm LDS. Yeah. So yeah. I gave it away. <laughs> yeah, um, I figured. And, and at first, I can't express my gratitude for you. You've been a huge part of my life. Thank it's you. Not, I feel like I know you. I walked in your door. I gave you a hug. Cause yeah. You've been a part of my story. And um, Thank you. And I actually feel like a kindred spirit. I also grew up with an alcoholic dad. Oh, For wow. better or worse, my dad left. So mm. he came back into my life like you and your dad. He come back sober? Yes, he did. Oh, good. And it's been an amazing transformation. And like you, I turned 40, you turned 50. So I feel yeah. like this like turning a new leaf thing. Yeah. But I'm going to, you rarely talk in too much detail about your family on, mm-hmm. on yeah. the air. And I think that's probably deliberate. It is. I guess. Yeah. Um, but I had the chance to meet your son. Max right. yeah. for just a few minutes. And I hate to make snap judgments, but I made one today, and I think it was the right one. I looked in this kid's eyes. He's a golfer. Mm-hmm. Came back from school. He talked about his straight A's. He didn't brag. He, you ask, and he told you. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking over here at a forty million dollar view, <laughs> and I know you didn't. Ro- you weren't raised in Chino with a forty million dollar view. <laughs> a four dollar view. <laughs> yeah. But but your kids were mm-hmm. presumably, and I have a similar situation, right? I didn't grow up with anything, right? Mm-hmm. But now we have airplanes, we have big houses and things like that. How do you avoid? How did you succeed in not raising entitled children? Man, that is hard, isn't it? That's what I it's really, really hard it's stuff. terrified. It, it is. Me. Kind of like uh, really intentional about it. Um, one thing is they were raised watching us get wealthy, so they saw the work. So that really helped, right? Like they saw me. Harder would be I was already super rich. They were born, and I was just kicking back. So I think most things with kids are caught, not taught. They catch things by watching Right? Not like, here, Max, let me give you a lesson about hard work. No, it's like, watch me work hard. Wait, hold on. Back up. That's a, that a just, that was, that was one for me. Yeah. Because I have a hard time helping my little girl understand that flying to Lake Powell in the family helicopter isn't mm-hmm. a normal thing. Mm-hmm. And so, like you said, they're watching the small things, mm-hmm. not the things that we're teaching them. Yeah. And so, where you're, what you're getting at is, and I think what you just said is, your kids have caught you do, living what you're preaching. Yeah, a lot. They've seen that. And then Christiana, my wife's really good at like when I'm busy, framing what it is, right? Because that's important too. So, you know, when, I, when they were little, where's daddy going? He's going to help people. He's going to change people's lives. He's going to do God's work. So it was always being framed like they almost wanted me to go do things, right? So that was a biggie. And then I just like, man, I've, I've been a gangster about letting them struggle. 
Like at school, like probably normally if we didn't have money, I remember, you know, they were at school and the teacher wasn't, or I, I would intervene. I didn't, I'd make them work stuff out at school. I wanted them to have failures. You know, I remember like fourth grade, no third grade, Bella comes out of school one day and evidently the kids at school told her that we were rich and she comes down to the car. She goes in the car and she looks at me. She goes, daddy, are we rich? <laughs> and I go, I don't know, sweetheart. I go, how much money do you have? Love it. And I remember looking at me, she goes, I got like $23. And I go, well, baby, I don't know if I'm rich or not, but you definitely aren't rich. You got a long <laughs> way to go. So I kind of made them feel like they had to learn stuff on their own. And um, I've just sort of never emphasized the material stuff. I just don't. It is really hard, though. One thing I do do, if we get on our jet order, I'm like, do you understand what's going on here? Like, do you really understand how abnormal this is? This is not promise. This is not given. This is our blessing, right? This can be taken as well. So I'm pretty good about that. And then you know, both. You know what else you were a gangster at, though, that, that I noticed is as soon as he told you he had good grades, you told him how proud you were. So if yeah. he sees you work, then he started working, and the first thing you did was I'm proud of you for those grades. Thanks, man. So, uh, that was really cool as Thanks, a parent. Thanks, man. I just taught. Yeah. Like, by the way, I've screwed up a ton of stuff as a parent. Like, I've said and done things in front of them I wish I had not done. You know, that's one of, one of those things that, like, parenting is hard, man. It's an art and a science, mm -hmm. and I've screwed a lot of it up, but. I think the other thing they've seen that's pretty cool is, like, uh, their mom and dad love each other. And also, like, we're into each other. Bro, like it's it, a big love, too. Yeah. Like, watching the – like, I just heard you say you – unprovoked in the kitchen to your wife, like, babe, you're hot. <laughs> I did. That's a big deal. How long have you been married? You've known uh, her since you were 14. years. Well, we've been together. <laughs> we've, no, we've, been, we've been dating 35 total, known each other 45, married 25. And I'll tell you this. His wife is a babe, but yeah. – I see inner beauty in that woman. Thank you. That is way, way deeper than what you see on the outside, and she's a bombshell outside. Thanks, man. Yeah, she's she's uh, like an amazing mom. She's just an amazing mother, brother. She like like you just asked her, you asked us to come to this thing that you're doing, and I'm like, yeah. yep, we're in. And she's like, quiet for a minute. Can the kids come? <laughs> you know, because she wants the kids to come. Well, so. even when we got here, we're getting ready to record the first episode. She's like, hey, my son's coming home from college, so I don't care if I interrupt your podcast. I'm gonna be hooting, hollering, and, and, and greeting my baby boy. <laughs> The other the last thing is, like, my kids are almost embarrassed by it. So when, when they were really young, and even now, they would rarely bring people over our house. Even when they do beach days, man, my daughter will meet people at the public beach <laughs> just because she doesn't want people to like her for that stuff. She doesn't want them to ever like her for stuff. My daughter shops at thrift stores. My daughter worked and paid for her own car. So I've had them earn things that otherwise they wouldn't have to earn just because I am so worried about that. It's a great question. Well, mission accomplished. I also Thank heard you. that your daughter has straight A's. And she's going she does, to, man. I won't announce her college if that's not public yeah, information. No, nah, she's going to Clemson. It's cool. No, I tell her that, and I'm glad Dabo. Your, your wife's heartbroken, by the way. I know, you, she told you she all this already. She told me, because yeah. this is an issue we she talk was, about. She wanted to go to Pepperdine, but Dabo Sweeney, the head coach there, is a friend of mine, and uh, you can't say no to him once you're in person, so she's going to Clemson. And, hey, man, look, no one here is perfect. The reason I don't talk about my kids, I will tell you this, like this is stuff no one knows, but there was an attempt to take my daughter once. And, uh, yeah, like a real attempt. And so just the privacy and security of my family like, is really, really like important. Like an actual kidnapping of an some An actual sort. real wow. one. Yeah, a real one. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that stuff in the day and age today, you got to be really judicious when you're showing your family and yeah. how you do it and all that kind of stuff, unfortunately. So no one knows that. But if we're going to be real today, we might as well be real. That's one of the reasons. Okay. Is this, this is the best part about this podcast is – this is real, Ed Milet. This is real, all of us. Um, I know a lot of you guys watch this uh, show and you listen to the show. And it's easy to think, like, oh, well, they're just saying things. They're, they're, they're giving us the highlight reel. What you're going to get right now is the highlight, the low light, the, the real life <laughs> part of what we are and what we do, and including Ed. Who's what, about, very, what are you doing? Like, you're gonna, you got the same issue. You got three little ones. Like, you, they're rolling up in helicopters and planes and... You know, islands and all the stuff you got. How it, do you do it, it? It's funny you should ask because I'm literally right in the middle of figuring that out. And my, I think my solution to that is I'm going to uh, take chunks out of our summers and our time and we're going to put them on farms. There you go. And we're going to make, I'm going to make those kids get their hands dirty. I'm going to teach them how to work, but I'm also going to teach them how to use dad's confidence because I'm the most confident son of a bitch you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. And my daughter's got that, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, starting to grow my boys. So I want to teach them how to leverage that at an early age. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter's in fourth grade. She rules the school. Absolutely that. rules the school. But she's also the one who befriends everybody. Mm -hmm. And I get emotional talking about it because it's like, I don't remember teaching her that, but she caught that. She caught it. 
That's right. She and so it. it's a it's a struggle for real. And and any of you who who become successful and you start to you know grow and and, and start to make money, trust me, this will be one of your biggest challenges: is teaching your kids what real life is versus what you've accomplished. That's so true. Well, I gotta say, so I've done seventy five hard four times, Andy and would love you to were in that. my ear for all those outdoor workouts. Right. Okay, so Thanks. one of those times you said. It was on your one of your one of your shows. You can't be simultaneously angry and ungrateful. That's right. You know, and the gratitude lesson is so important. So every night, literally, it's a, it's a, it's a ritual in my household. I go around, all of my kids, and they're little that. kids. I love that. Tell me what you're grateful for. I love that. And I'll that. get things like bees. I'm grateful for bees because that's why we cool? have flowers and pollination. And one yeah, of my kids said, "I'm grateful for me." I said, "That's interesting. What, what are you grateful for?" He said, "Well, I have a body, and I can I can fulfill promises to myself." I'm like, "This is a seven year old saying oh, this." Oh wow, I love that. And it's that, so brother. cool. So I think. Having that gratitude check-in, you know, with your yep. kids. Well, I told you, like, one of the things I took from your church is the family home evening. And so we've done this since they were little. Ours is Monday nights, right? And that's one of the things we go around. What are you grateful for right now? It's so cool having kids because they, they make you more grateful for the small stuff that you walk by every day, like bees or whatever it is, right? Like, yep. And it's a muscle you're building in your kid. So that as they get older, that thing grows. Like I talk, you know, in the show, we're talking about the RAS, all the sophisticated stuff in your brain. But like your kids now look for things to be grateful for because they know their dad's going to ask them it's about coming. it. Right. And it's so yeah. it's such a wonderful thing, man. And it's the antidote to most of the crap in our life. It's the antidote to most of the stuff that, you know, it's easy to be grateful for the ocean. But the truth is, and I've said this before, a true story, man. When we were first married, I went so broke. We had her. One morning I said, hey, babe, your car got stolen. And it was just tragic because I couldn't get the go. It turns out I wasn't stolen. Got repoed. It, it was repoed. <laughs> and then our house got, she's in there laughing right now. Then our house got foreclosed on. That was all bad. But then we lived in this apartment, not that far from here, man. And the water got turned off. We had no running water. You don't have water. You have power. That's bad. You don't have water. You can't shower. You can't brush your teeth. You can't cook. Can't flush the toilet. Can't flush the toilet. And that's an issue for someone like me. Believe me. So, <laughs> so anyway, we would get up in the morning and there was a, a, a shower at the pool of our apartment building. And I'm out there trying to be this entrepreneur selling the dream. And I would have to grab a towel. She'd grab a towel. And I would hold this towel up while my new bride took a shower outside. And then we would switch and she'd hold the towel up. And I would take a shower and brush my teeth. And we'd walk back up the apartment stairs, man, like, I was so ashamed, like, so emasculated. And she had to go get a job to support me as an entrepreneur. Most people don't know that story. And now, bro, not every morning anymore. I'd be lying if I said it was every morning, but probably, like, eight to ten mornings a month. As grateful as I am when I look at that ocean, when I hit the switch in the shower, talk about simple things, and the water comes out and hits my face, I swear to you, I go, thank you, God. Yeah. Like, thank you. Something that simple from that really difficult time. So when your kids learn to have gratitude for small stuff, then, you know, like, this stuff is just gravy. Yeah. What was the turning point when you were having to shower at the pool and all that fun stuff until you actually like, flipped the switch? And you want to know the, re the real? Never said this before. This is cool. Uh, I didn't do it. Someone did for me. She did, and she actually, like, did a little intervention with a couple of my friends, believe it or not. Sat me down like, hey, dude, what is wrong with you? Like, you're like a zombie. You're not that confident guy anymore. Because I had been up. And then I've been down. You need to get your act together. She even told me, she goes, this is not the dude I married. You know, it wasn't about the money. It was about the effort. Like, she'd come home. No joke. This is real. She would come home from working all day. I'd be on the couch when she'd get there. And she's like, uh-uh, this is not who I married. And they did, like, literally an intervention. It was like, you're better than this. We believe in you. We love you. You can do it. And not that far from here, it's a true story. My brother-in-law worked for L.A. Cellular. And I was an entrepreneur with a struggling business. And I met him at this beach. It was actually this beach, now that I say it. It wasn't in another beach. It was this beach. And the reason I went to visit him at the beach is I was going to ask him for a job to quit my business. I've never said this out loud because I forgot. And we were walking about 100 yards from here. I said, hey, man, let's take a walk because my sister and our family was there. And we started to take a walk. And I was about to get the words out of my mouth. I was going to go, hey, man, you got anything for me? I, was, I couldn't say the words. I swear to you, brother. Instead, I said, hey, man, how long are you going to stay at this shitty job? <laughs> and he goes, what? He was making like 200 grand at the time. I said, you should come to work with me. And I remember it was like an out-of-body experience. It was completely not why I went there, completely not the reason I took the walk with him. And for some reason, I couldn't get my being to ask him for this job. Instead, I recruited him to come to work for me. <laughs> and two days later, he quit that job came to work with me and he still works in my firm to this day 
Wow. That happened right on this beach, and I completely forgot about it till we were sitting here right now. Dude, that that's cool. That's cool, Kenny. I love that story because you turned doubt, you know, fear into faith. Yeah, in an instant. And it's like sometimes that's just a calling on your heart because he had running water. I didn't. He owned a house. I didn't. I had bankruptcy, or not bankruptcy, I never filed bankruptcy. I had foreclosure and repos. He didn't have any of that stuff. And I go, when are you going to quit that stupid job? <laughs> Crazy that came out of my mouth. I love it. There's something you weren't planning on at all. Not at all, bro. I went there I went there to go with my hat in hand and say, help me. Yeah. Crazy. I just remember that right now. <laughs> That's a huge turning point. Bro, massive. That's probably the turning point. Yeah, it, massive. It was the intervention they did and then that walk. And by the way, my brother-in-law's probably listening to this. He remembers it very clearly. I roped him into the business. He's been doing it now 25 years with me. Dude, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. What else we got for Ed, guys? All right. Sorry, I'm, I'm hogging the mic here. I got Sorry. so much. With all your prodigious talents and your assets and the accomplishments you've done and the people you've influenced, you're kind of it, ostensibly at the top. Right? People look at you and say, Ed Milet, he's at the top, the pinnacle of the zenith. He's mm -hmm. achieved it. He's, re he's done. What keeps you hungry? Mm-hmm. You're, you told a story about Ray Ray, right? Yeah. The fight that your dad yeah. made you go have with Ray Ray. <laughs> Who or what is your Ray Ray today? What what mountain do you have yet to climb? Yeah. Well, I don't feel like I'm at the top. I mean, uh, until you say something like that, I don't walk around every day going, oh, wow, I'm at the top. You know, well, this is incredible. So I don't ever think that. If I, Like, I, I'm not going to give you the stuff that's like, I'll just tell you, I still am afraid to be broke. I mean, I, there's things I want to do. I can tell you what they are, but like, I'm not going to tell you that I don't have any fear about, like, that I need to keep working hard for this not to go. And I don't want that kind of boogeyman to go away. I kind of dig him. I've mm -hmm. talked with Dwayne Johnson about this. I've talked with different really top athletes about this. Like, there's a little bit of a fear that it could go away. And that's not unhealthy to me. It keeps me sharp. So it keeps you hungry. It does keep me hungry. And so, I mean, it, it's nonsense. I own this place free and clear. I own my jet free and clear. I own the island free and clear. I own my desert house. I own two other oceanfront houses down the street free and clear. Like, I don't, there's no debt, right? I have no debt. That's not something to brag about. Sometimes debt is really, really good, right? A lot of people made a lot of money with debt the last few years. But there's this thing in me, man, that's like, hey, I still want to prove something. And then the other part of me is like, I'm addicted to growing. Like, I'm addicted to it. I'm, you were talking about earlier, we were just getting ready to record. You're like, I can't sit still. I have yeah. a hard time sitting still, and I need to learn to sit still. Yeah, you probably do a little bit. But, like, I wasn't born to, like, sit around and watch Netflix. I, I like doing it a little bit. But, like, I was born to do something great with my life so were you guys like I kind of know that and great isn't like every day I'm making millions of dollars it's like I care about people like I want to help people um like I love that y'all were here in my home you know what I mean like I wanted you to come here today I don't I didn't want to do it in some studio or whatever I want you to be with my family and in my house so I think that's part of it and then I just don't um I don't have this muscle where I'm like, this is, yeah, it's not for me like a destination. It's like a process. It's the process of growing. It's the process of meeting my other self. It's, I kind of like meeting the new me. Like my daughter is the one who picks on me and we were at dinner for my 50th. And she goes, daddy, are you in a midlife crisis? <laughs> and I'm like, what? why would you say something like that? She goes, come on, like Instagram, you're taking selfies all the time. I think you're dying your beard now, I'm pretty sure. You know, she was ripping on me. And I said, Ed, uh, are you dying I'm, your beard? Yeah, no, nah, I can't admit to that. <laughs> I can't confirm or deny that. Um, my son's in there laughing, and so is my wife because they know this conversation. And I said, uh, yeah, I am. But I said, Bella, I was in a young life crisis. And you know what? If you come back in five years, I'll be in a 55-year-old crisis. I'm in a crisis every year to be a different me by the end of that year, to be a better me. And I said, Bella Boo, all the cells in your body pretty much regenerate themselves every year. Your lung tissue is about every six months. Like, there's all parts of you physically regenerating themselves <clears throat> and becoming new. Shouldn't the inside part of your spirit and your mind become new? And I said, so yeah, I'm in a midlife crisis and I'll be in an old life crisis too. I don't want to be the same person. I already lived that life. I was already that guy. I want to be the next one. Yeah. Now, all the same character, all the same principles, but living a better expression of them, right? I've already expressed this version of me. The world's already got that. I don't want to change my principles or my character or what I stand for, but I want to express it better. I want to express it differently. 
maybe that sounds like one of those podcast answers, but it's like totally legit. It's actually what I think about. And there's a lot of uh, high profile people, guys like Jocko, guys like Andy Frazella. Uh, Love both of them. B- amazing guys. Yep. They're getting pressure right now since the world seems to be turning to shit in certain ways. Mm-hmm. It's you know I'm not a doom and gloom guy, and I don't like to talk about that, but mm-hmm. they're getting pressure to get into leadership positions. Yeah. Is politics anything that could ever happen to you? The world uh, needs a guy like you, and I'm going to sit here and say, mm. I'm not going to say you should, is that but I'm not. endorsement heavy? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's not, an uh, official. If, if Ed ran for anything, oh, king, king of whatever, I mean, I, he'd have my vote. But okay. is that, are you completely opposed to that, or is that if the world needs it? I, I would say pretty much opposed. Because um, I've had some heat to do that recently from people who help people do that. I think if I thought, like, that expression, I, I think if I thought I could do more to help people doing that than what I'm doing right now, right. then I would do it. But I think there are people probably that would rather go raise all the money that I don't want to have to go raise to do it. Um, although I wouldn't need that much. I could use most of my own. Right now, no. And I don't I think that... Oh, shoot. Well, that's, <laughs> I got two votes, me and you. I think right not right now, and I don't think probably I will. But if the time came and I felt like, hey, man, I could really make a difference and no one else could do it, you know, then maybe that I would. Um, I would not run for something small or local. I would run for something national if I did it. Um, but uh, I don't know that I have the temperament to keep the, to, to say the political things that are required. That's why I admire some of the people recently that have gone into politics that are like, you know, I'm going to tell you what I really think. I think both the guys you listed would be wonderful dudes to carry that a baton. I'd love to support people and help them with as well. I can help them write their speeches. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that kind of stuff. But I can't say that I would never do it. If you'd asked me five years ago, for sure, no way, no how, impossible. And my wife definitely doesn't want me to do it. But um, there's an opening. I mean, if it really was needed and I could help, I might do it. What excites you? Uh, humans changing. I believe in humans. Yeah. I, I think that like everything in the world right now is like that we all suck. We're against each other. I think we have way more in common and we get along a whole lot more than the media would like to tell us that we do. And I got in an Uber yesterday, dude. And uh, I love when I get in an Uber, it drives my wife nuts. But I'm like, she, people, are, you don't have a driver. I have a driver a lot, but I like getting in Ubers. Cause that's where the real dudes are. Oh, yeah. So I always say this. I'm like, tell me your story. And this dude. Uh, was driving me and he's from Lebanon and I'm like tell me about Lebanon man he's like oh I lived in a gated community I said there's gated communities in Lebanon I didn't know he goes yeah I live with Jews and Muslims and agnostics and Christians all on my street I said you're kidding me he goes we'd have literally block parties I said you're kidding me he goes well yeah there's little pockets like that and he goes I said well why are you driving Uber he goes oh to help my children through college I'm thinking oh they're at a JC he goes I have a daughter at Harvard a son at Yale and my young son is going to Stanford next year. And he's driving I went, an Uber. I said, what did you just say? You came from Lebanon, you escaped there, and you have two children at Ivy's League, another one at Stanford? I go, you're amazing. He goes, I'm not. My wife is. Let me tell you about my wife. And then he tells me about his precious wife. And I'm like, man, humans are good. Yeah. Humans are awesome. Yeah. They just need to feel love from other people. When people feel hate, they often respond with it. When they feel threatened, they respond with a threat. But when people feel loved, when they feel seen, when they don't feel invisible, and they feel like they belong and have something to offer, humans are awesome. Even when you're watching humans respond in ways that are brutal to one another, it's typically their fear happening. It's the lack of love. It's the lack of connection. So if I thought politically I could change the environment and the culture where we emphasize love and caring for one another and belief in one another and individual initiative, then I would do it because I know humans are good. They're made in the image and likeness of God. They were born to do something great. They're just not very much reminded of it often. And that's one of the issues that just kills me with people. So, yeah, I love humans. Yeah. And this is a silly question. Would you run for office? I'm going to be governor of Utah. Wow, that was definitive. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to be. I, I, I have no desire to get into politics, but when, when I was— Like in the next 10 years? Next 10 years. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's just going to happen. I freaking love it. <laughs> I don't. I, I've. I've uh, you have my full endorsement. I've, I've kept it. I, I've. I've. It's, it's been bottled up inside me for a long time. I felt it when I was nine years old, when I was governor of a school play. Mm. Hit me, and I was just like, oh, I don't want to be governor. Politics sucks. Yeah. But I feel like the world's changing, and they need people that they can relate to. Yeah. And uh, a lot of politicians aren't relatable, mm. and 
I believe that that's uh, that's something that very well could happen. And like I said, it's not it's not it's not something I'm 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 going towards. But I think we've made big news right now. Yeah, I think we've made big news. You know what it is? Politics does not uh, draw our best, and we need to change that in the country. Our best people should be leading the country. Yeah, and by and large, by and large, there's exceptions. We don't do that. Yep. And so if someone like you got involved, man, that would be wonderful. Okay, good. I got, I'm going to know the governor of Utah. I'm well-connected. <laughs> there I didn't you know go. I was You're well-connected. Well connected. Here's a silly, candid question. Yeah. I'm afraid of crabs. I hate crabs. Mm. What are you afraid of? Snakes. Snakes. I hate snakes, man. I hate snakes. Really? I hate heights. It's weird because we fly in helicopters and all that <laughs> stuff. But snakes, dude. Like, and I have a desert house. We had a rattlesnake in our front yard. I'm so afraid of snakes. <laughs> this is a true story. All these little kids. It was a birthday party. Babe, whose birthday party was it with the rat? Easter. Who who was? We had a bunch of kids there. Why were they there? Okay. Easter. Yeah. So we had a rattlesnake at Easter at our house, and I'm like, babe, go kill that rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> That's how l- lack of a man I am. <laughs> And, and my wife went and killed the damn rattlesnake. That's I'm amazing. afraid of snakes, dude. We had another house where there was a rattlesnake on our front porch, and I was at the house, and our and our housekeeper went and killed the damn snake because I wouldn't go out and touch that snake. So That's I am amazing. really afraid of snakes. I know that doesn't make me look like a tough guy. I would. I've I've had Mike Tyson mad at me to my face. By the way, I had Chuck Liddell on my show, and Chuck Liddell's on. He's become a good buddy of mine. And somehow at the end of the interview, I said, "This is a great story." I said. Chuck, if you, he brought Tyson up. I said, if you and Tyson got in a fight in your prime, who would win? And he goes, well, boxing, he'd win. In a cage, I'd kill him. And I go, okay, forget that. Street fight. He goes, ah, I'd, I'd, I'd annihilate him. I'd annihilate him. And it kind of made news that he said this on my show. So I'm at the gym like two months later, and my son's telling me, hey, Ed, hey, Dad, Mike Tyson works out at our gym. I go, why would Mike Tyson be in Laguna Beach? That's ridiculous. Sure enough, one day I'm running on the treadmill, and there's this dude next to me, <sighs> sweating like crazy. And I don't look because, you know, I'm thinking it's someone who wants to talk to me or whatever at the gym. And I look, and this dude has tree trunk legs, these huge legs. I look, and it's Tyson. And he goes, I won't say the word. He goes, he goes, hey, MFR, <laughs> when you're done, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, champ. <laughs> and I'm like, you got it. a true story. I'm like, okay, champ. Yeah. And I'm like, running faster. <laughs> Why does Mike Tyson just call me an MFR? <laughs> this is a true story. This is a true story. And I get off of it, and he's standing there. He goes, you ready? And we start to walk, and he goes, he, I'm going to do this to you how he did it. We're walking, and he goes, hey. He just, dude, I watched this being come out of him. His face is like this. He goes, you, you talk fucking Chuck Liddell. A street fight to the death. I'll fucking kill him. And he's, like, spitting. <laughs> and I'm shaking. <laughs> I'll fucking kill him. <laughs> Like that. Like, look how my head just was. And I went, oh, my God. I go, okay, champ, I'll tell him, man. Cover go, your ears. <laughs> I go, how in the world did he know Liddell said this on my show? Right? I have no idea. I said, And I said, hey, man, I got you. <laughs> totally cool. I can tell you, as scared as I was, I've only been afraid of two men in my life. My dad, I've been in a lot of different scraps and fights. And that moment with Tyson, I saw some spirit in this dude in that moment. That was, I know why these big old dudes bigger than him were like, oh my gosh. It wasn't just that he hit hard. This dude emanates an energy where he's like, he is going to eat me. Like literally, which he did. He ate, he ate a Vanderbilt Holyfield here. Right? got a bite of it. But I mean, there was a spirit in there that was just like, wow. And I'm more afraid of snakes. <laughs> I would rather fight Tyson than go kill a rattlesnake. Wow. I hope he doesn't hear that. Well, sorry, champ. <laughs> Guys, we have five minutes. Go ahead. All Anybody right. else? Yeah. I mean, Jason? Yeah. Um, well, one of, the, one of the questions popped up. Um, Jason, when, right to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. One of the reasons, uh, one of the things that popped up when you were talking earlier is uh, that low point in your life. Uh, I, I feel like people can talk to you until they're blue in the face, like mm-hmm. get up, get going, do mm-hmm. the thing that you want, you know, make, you know, do the thing that you need to do. Yeah. What did you find in you that actually brought you out of that? Right. Cause mm-hmm. I, I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't think it was the people talking to you. Was it? No, it was, uh, it was just starting to take the steps. It was like, and this whole thing about one more is a real thing. It was just like, look, here's what I'm going to do in spite of how I feel. I'm going to operate out of what I know I'm supposed to do, not how I feel. I'm going to finally, here's where I was. I was a very average person. Here's why I was average. How I felt is how I acted. That's how most people are. They feel great. They do great. They feel bad. They lay around. 
And in that moment, I'm like, I don't feel good. I've had a pattern of not feeling good. If I'm going to wait around till I feel good to take some steps, this ain't going to happen. But what if maybe if I take these steps, then I'll feel good. And so slowly but surely, I'm like, I'm just going to make these contacts. I'm going to make these calls. I'm going to go see these people. And I just started taking steps. It's not always what you do on the days you're motivated that separates you. Because everyone does well today. It's what you do on the days you're not motivated. And so for me, it was like, I'm going to take steps towards my potential, even though I don't feel like it every day. And you go, well, that's easy to say, not hard to do. Actually, it's not that hard to do. You just have to do it. You have to actually get up, get dressed, put your clothes on, and take steps towards it. And then what I would do is I'd like little promises. So I was just a mess. Like I had no self-confidence because I had a reputation with me of not doing stuff I said I was going to do. So I started going, what, how can I rig the game so I do what I say? This sounds really stupid. I'm going to tell you what I did. I'm going to take you back to when I'm 23 years old. I'm going to set my clothes out the night before for the next day. Simple thing I don't have to think about in the morning, something I can control doing. I'm going to make my bed in the morning. I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. I'm going to do some meditation and prayer when I wake up, and I'm going to go to the gym. And I actually started setting my clothes up, getting up at 6 a.m., stuff I could do. I said my prayers and my meditation, right? I did the things I said I was going to do. And all of a sudden, now when I said I'm going to make 10 calls, I'm like, I could do that. Then when I said I'm going to make 1000 bucks this week, I could do that. 10000 bucks this week. 10,000 bucks this day. So it started with small stuff when I didn't feel like it and I rigged the game on stuff I could completely control. Yeah, I, 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 that's amazing because it's a lot of people think it's, you know, things turn on immediately for them. You know, they see you who you are today, not yeah. not the I laid my clothes out guy. I, yeah. They I, see I, you as the guy that you are today, I, which is which is the hard part for most people to see. It's they, not they inspiring. Just see it's yeah. the before and the after. I'll tell you one more thing. We can go a couple more minutes. I'll tell you the, the one thing. I have a, you don't know this story, but like I wanted to look rich when I wasn't. And so I wanted to, I thought, no one's going to take me seriously. This is a true story, brother, okay? They're going to laugh already, my family. I wanted to drive a Mercedes. I thought, no one's going to take me serious in my business if I'm not driving a Benz. So there was this thing called a penny saver back in the day. It would be like a glorified Craigslist now. And I'm looking for convertible Mercedes. This is so true, dude, you don't even believe this. And you know what this is, but all of a sudden it's 60 grand, 60 grand, 60 grand. It says Mercedes 600 SL parentheses kinda I'm like tell me more <laughs> <laughs> and what it was was a Chrysler LeBaron oh hell yeah kit car with a Mercedes body on it so kit cars have welded other car bodies oh, yeah. this thing was two feet too long <laughs> interior was a LeBaron you know air the heat blew constantly this gets way better I drive down to Dana Point I meet this lady and I say tell me about this kit car she's like look it's five thousand dollars and it's a wonderful, only about half the people won't know it's real. And I'm like, I'll give you four grand. She goes, I'll take it. So she takes the four grand from me and she goes, there's one catch I didn't tell you. I swear to you, brother, this is true. She goes, um, it's actually not welded on there. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I said, how's the kit on the car? She goes, it's uh, Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, what did you just say? Say that again, because he's already got my money. She goes, it's Velcroed on there, but most of the car stays together pretty good. I said, the machine I'm going to drive 60 miles an hour is Velcroed together. She goes, you don't have to worry when you're driving fast. She goes, but when you drive up to a stoplight, don't stop too suddenly, because the front left headlight will fly out into the intersection. <laughs> And dude, more than a, I have a good social media following. If there was social back in the day, I would be the most viral mf'er of all time. Because more than a hundred times in my life, in this dude's life, that headlight went out in the intersection. I had to get out of that car, stop the four-way traffic, grab my headlight. You imagine people watching. What the hell is this dude doing? I would grab my the Velcro's hanging out. I would go grab my headlight, run back to my car, Velcro that sucker back on, and jump back in the car but about 30 of the times i was so rattled i shut the door too hard and it would fall off and people are honking trying to make their left turn i'm trying to put my door back on the car dude i swear to god and i drove that car for four years i made seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars one year driving that car i swear to you and it got stolen the fourth year it got stolen and the dude that stole the car got one block from our house and just left the car with the keys in it because he figured out what it was i swear to you i got pulled over in that car by the cops because they thought it was stolen and that's all because it was like wrong license plates so i went from a velcroed mercedes dude. to a global express jet 
<laughs> in a number Shit. of a, a decade or two doing the stuff that's in my book. I swear to you, that is a hundred. Babe, is that a hundred percent true? Yeah. yeah, she's like, yeah, she had to drive that to me in that car. That might be one of the most incredible. <laughs> yeah. She's oh, saying, you sent the wife I out to get the, the wife to go get the daggum <laughs> deal. <laughs> and then at the same time, man, we were so broke. We were so broke. I bought her a Mustang when her other car got repossessed. <laughs> And the doors didn't work, so she had to get, go through her trunk to get to the front seat. So here's this power couple you see on Instagram. I'm driving a Velcro car. Her car, everywhere she goes, she has to climb through the trunk and crawl into the driver's seat. <laughs> is that awesome? Dude, that is so awesome. That's the truth. See, this is what we're here for, guys. This is the real Ed Milet. This is the real true. story. This, is, this, is, this helps everybody understand that, look, doesn't matter where you're at right now. Go buy a Velcro Mercedes because that's a starting point. It doesn't matter. Just go start somewhere. And since we call this the Heavy Checklist Podcast, I want to leave with some marching orders, and this will be the final final round of, uh, of thoughts that we have here. I want every person at the table to give one checklist item. As pilots, Jason and I, we have checklists that we follow. Your pilots of your jet, they yep. follow a checklist. If they don't follow that checklist, a lot of those items are written in blood. Yeah. And if they don't follow that, they crash, they you know, people die. Yep. So, uh, luckily, our checklist is not that severe. However, these checklist items are very important. And as we leave them at the end of the podcast, a lot of people do write these things down. And you should be writing these things down. Uh, and I'm going to start. And then we're going to go around. Whoever has one, I want everybody to give one item. I don't care if it's your favorite popcorn. doesn't matter. Okay. My one checklist item for you right now is drink more water. Mm. Like, do it. You, you're not drinking enough water. I don't care who you are. You're not drinking enough water and get more electrolytes. It's changed my life completely. I drink uh, eight ounces of water before bed with the, the liquid IV, the electrolytes. Mm -hmm. uh, you wake up in the morning feeling like a million bucks. And it's so stupid. It's so simple. But it's one of those things that you probably need to be reminded of. So sorry that mine is so simple. But mm -hmm. I promise you it's one that's probably going to make you feel the best. So who's next? I'll take one. I'm going to steal Ed's actually gave us earlier. Because he, he's a guy that wants to aspire people to be better, to change people. And one thing that he did <laughs> was he asked his Uber driver what his story was. Yeah. Like, if you want, people need to feel that recognition, like you said, yeah. in order to feel loved and, and basically aspire that change they're looking for. If you just ask one person what their story is, find something out about them, that's, that's my checklist item. Ask somebody what their story is and listen to what they got to say. That's good, man. <clears throat> also inspired by Ed believe in people see the good in them including yourself mm, it's really good um, I'm going to get personal here a little bit I lost my best friend <clears throat> last year to cancer 39 years old, 4 kids just the healthiest guy, straight as narrow right. and I also lost a daughter in 2013 oh. and this kind of harkens back to your book The Power of One More you don't realize the power of one more until you take that away this is what mm -hmm. you just talked about with Heavy yep. you take that away Imagine your life without one more hug of your kids that night. Imagine your life with your kids as it could be your last day mm -hmm. because you never know when it's going to be. And when you do that, your life is so much more rich. Brother, I never complain about changing a diaper, ever. ever. I yeah. lost an infant. I'll never complain about that. Never complain about putting my kids to sleep because my friend who died early, I know he'd give anything to put his kids to sleep one more oh, time. Wow. So the power of one more. Um, just imagine your life without that one extra thing, that one extra opportunity that you have, and it would be a rich life. That's so wonderful. thank you for That's wonderful. articulating what I couldn't in your book. That's wonderful, man. Really wonderful. Wow. Uh, I just pre-ordered your book as thank, well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> While you guys were talking last time, I pre-ordered it. <laughs> so I can't you. recommend that as a checklist yet because okay. I haven't read it. Okay. Uh, but one thing is uh, blissful dissatisfaction. Uh, mm -hmm. That is one thing that comes back to me on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Is is go listen to that because oh, who introduced it, you to that again? I, I think I came up with it and told uh, yeah, you about oh, it. Right? Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I, think I, was, I think I told everybody. I told the whole it. damn yeah. world about it. Yeah. <laughs> that was, no, that's a good one. I love that uh, one actually. Uh, the, the main reason is is it's, it's such a simple concept, but it's something that takes practice every day. And I yeah. find I catch myself constantly yeah. not practicing it properly. I'm mm -hmm. I'm out of balance on that mm -hmm. all the time. I'm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I spent all my 20s hustling as hard as I possibly can, mm. completely being dissatisfied where I'm at, mm. pushing as hard as I could, which did get me to where I'm at today, but it caused a myriad of, of health problems and issues, and mm. I had no social life and all mm. this stuff because I didn't actually slow down to respect what I had. Mm. And, and I still find myself doing that, right? Mm. 
I, I finally bought a new house. I'm, I'm very comfortable finally in my life. Um, I have great management in my company and now I'm getting too satisfied and I'm sitting there for a <laughs> moment just, just, but I love this, right? I, I constantly reel on that. So I, I, I you experience these things on a daily basis, but I, I would say my my checklist item is go listen to that. I I, I honest, that's one thing that I reference almost every day. In my Just life, type it so. into any podcast platform, guys. Blissful dissatisfaction. It'll pull it up. It is one of the most compelling podcasts you'll ever listen to in your in your entire life. So that's a great one, Jason. Thank, thank you, now uh, thank you, we're gonna save the best for last. Well, first thing, man, is I. This is one of the most wonderful days I've ever had, brother. I mean, I was looking forward to today. I had no idea. You have such. You're such a good man, Dave. But like. You're surrounding yourself with really good men. This is Better a great group me. of people. And so are the guys that are over here, too. Like, I really, I wish we go two or three more hours. I mean it, too. I mean, that's why I said, let's just keep going. Yeah. You know, and so I just want to tell you, man, I really appreciate this. I'll give everybody something else to take away. I have a chapter in the book about this becoming an impossibility thinker. Start to operate out of your imagination and your dreams and not your history and your memories. So when you were a kid, the reason you were so happy when you were a kid, especially when you were little, one, you were just with God more recently. And two, you lived in your imagination all the time. Yep. You were imagining. And slowly but surely in life, that begins to get suppressed. And we begin to accumulate memories and history. And then we operate out of these patterns of these memories and these histories. And we just sort of repeat the same emotions and the same life with a different set of circumstances with different people. But it's the same stuff out of our history and our memory. But if you begin to create a new life out of your imagination and your dreams and do it repetitively, like give yourself the gift of dreaming more often. And I'm not talking about when you sleep. I'm talking about when you're awake, yeah. driving in the car. Like you're a dreamer, Dave. Like you're a dreamer. Bro, I, listen to me <clears throat> real quick. I don't want to yeah. take too much time. First time I flew a helicopter, I went and did a demo flight. I didn't have, I probably had $1,000 in the bank. I went and did a demo flight. It was 50 bucks. They were trying to get me signed up for school. After that moment, I was hooked on helicopters. Yeah. I just could not think about anything else. So I would drive down the road. I'm, I'm a 25-year-old man driving down the road, yes. and I would grab the steering wheel as if it was the cyclic on a helicopter, and I would reach down and grab yes. the imaginary collective, yes. and, and I was driving down the road pretending and visualizing that it was my helicopter. Yes. And guess what? Five years later, however long it was, I bought the helicopter of my dreams, and now I just bought another helicopter that is even bigger and better than anything I could have ever imagined it's because I literally... If you can feel the emotions yes. of what you want, it's going to happen. It does. And by the way, what they would know about you and I and our friends is we're always texting each other our dreams yeah. and stuff we're working on, too. Like, we live in our imagination and our dreams. That's a perfect example. And by the way, you did one other thing. Sometimes go touch your dreams just a little bit. Yeah. Stay. I used to do this thing. We live at the beach now, but when we didn't have a lot of money, I'd say, babe, if I have a really good two months and we close a bunch of sales, let's do one night at the Ritz Carlton. Yeah. We'll go do one night, 400 bucks or whatever it was. I'll go play golf. You go get a massage, sit around the pool. We'll have dinner that night. And we'll touch the dream for one night. Dude, that, and, I love that. And so we would do this right. And if I didn't hit the sales, we didn't go. If I didn't hit the number, we didn't go. But what would happen is, here's why it matters. It matters. Your mind gravitates towards what it's most familiar with. So if it's familiar with your worries and your fears and your past and all the stuff you're concerned about, it keeps moving there. But if it's familiar with your imagination and your dreams and you have the benefit of flying that helicopter once, touching one night of your dreams, going walking at a beach and just looking up at the beach houses, which architecture do you like, oh. which door, all of a sudden that starts to feel those emotions and you move towards that like you do that governor on that airplane, yep, right? It yep, moves yep. towards it. So that would be my key. Start to imagine and dream again and get out of your memory and your history all the time. Bro, that is incredible advice from one of the most incredible guys I know, a, guy, a man that I'm proud to call, you know, one of my best friends. He's just a good, good man. And my final words are going to be, Ed, you've got an event coming up for people who have purchased your book. Can yeah. we talk about that real quick? Yeah, it's crazy. So it's, uh, hopefully you're coming, but it's me, Andy Fursella. Listen to this. Me, Andy Fursella. I'll forget some people. Eric Thomas, who's yes. one of the greatest speakers in the world. Mel Robbins, Rob Deerdick, Jenna Kutcher, Marie Forleo, John Gordon, Dean Graziosi, Jim <laughs> Quick, I mean, it's an unbelievable You're group. Blow the roof off that building. It's gonna be nuts. It's May 27th. If you pre-order my book, here's the deal: it's free. Watch it virtually in your house or your office. That's it. It's a free event. If you want to come to it, May 27th in Raleigh, you like buy like 25 books. But if you go to maxoutlive.com, maxoutlive.com. It'll give you all the details. Guys, the, the link to that is going to be in the show notes. We in the description. That is a big freaking deal because that yep. list of people he just named off is Insane. an absolute powerhouse group. And 
it's not like you're it's not like you're buying a raffle ticket. You're buying something that's going to change your life and, and it's going to give you an opportunity yeah. to go be around people that are going to change your life even further. So Ed, dude, I had a lot of respect for you coming into this. Thanks, man. Leaving here today, I, I love you I love more you, than bro. I ever thought I could. Thanks, you're a good man. You're a so real you. man. You're in a, you're like you're you're, you're down to earth, and Thanks, I think people are going to see a side of you in this that they didn't know existed. They didn't oh, know man. Velcro Ed. <laughs> Uh, that's, and that's your new name. You're Velcro, Velcro Eddie, Eddie to me, dude. So, Velcro Eddie, so, uh, With that said, guys, you got the marching orders. You heard the checklist items. These are all people that I admire. These are all people that have changed my lives or changed my life. And uh, honestly, take this advice seriously. Please don't disregard it. And uh, last thing I'm going to say, do not sleep on this book because – it's going to be a game changer. So, Ed, thank you for having us in your home. Thank you for introducing us to your wife, your kids. Like, I literally feel like I'm just at my buddy's house. Oh, you and are your buddy's uh, house, that, brother. That, and, that's amazing. And so. you guys are all welcome here anytime. It was just wonderful, man. I wonderful just loved happens. having you. Thank you.